Well, I mean, you think about that song, we're just on a, a big ball, it's hanging into nothing but God's, by God's grace. I mean, really, think about that. Galatians chapter 5, thank God for <clears throat> his goodness of sustaining us. Galatians chapter 5, in your Bibles tonight, we're going to pick up where we left off at last week, and we're going to try to finish this chapter tonight. <clears throat> This next song deals with the doctrine of what we would call the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a doctrine to where Jesus Christ gave his life so that we can have life. And the Bible teaches if you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you'll give your life to him, you'll find it. Because Jesus says he has come to give us life and life more abundantly. Amen. So when he died on the cross, he died not because of what he had done wrong, but he died in your place so that you would not have to deal with the penalty of sin. And he dealt with that for you. The substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an incredible thing. It really is. So this song, it makes perfect sense the title of it is, I Should Have Been Crucified. Now, I have no problem admitting that, knowing that what the Lord has done on the cross, he did for me because I should have been the one being crucified. But because of God's goodness, love, and mercy, he sent his son to be a substitute so that I would not have to pay for that penalty. So you'll listen to the song, I Should Have Been Crucified, and then we're going to get into Galatians chapter number five, dealing with the subject of how to live a life that pleases God. appreciate that. All right, Galatians chapter number five, and I believe the young folks are going to go over into the junior church room. Uh, we do have a program Easter night. So Easter PM night, we have a program with our youth, 
And then Sunday morning, we're going to have, God willing, a, a, a composed thought of music. And we're looking forward to that with preaching. <clears throat> Galatians chapter number 5. We'll start in verse number 16. Now, this is a verse by verse preaching series. And what we're getting into tonight really speaks for itself. So not a whole lot of backing up needs to be introduced by way of what we've talked about. And what we are dealing with tonight is this, pleasing God with your life. Pleasing God with your life. Can I mention something that Paul the Apostle said about you and me? Paul the Apostle said, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created, now listen, all things were created by him and for him. You have been created for God. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 16. Paul the Apostle says in verse 16 of Galatians chapter 5, This I say then. Now that phrase, this I say then, is coming off of something that he has already laid out. And what he had laid out is this. As a Christian, you're not going to be perfected by anything other than the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have to allow God, His grace, by faith, to motivate you to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you try to add to that or try to do something apart from the gospel, you're going to fall short of pleasing the Lord with your life. Now, there are things that we do. But there's only one thing that can be done that we adhere to that brings honor and glory to God. So he says, this I say then, walk, now watch, walk in the Spirit. Now that's the Holy Spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh, that would be you in your natural sense, lusteth against the Spirit. And that is the Spirit of God and the spirit against the flesh. So we find a little bit of confrontation here where the flesh confronts the spirit and doesn't want the spirit to have its way and the spirit of God confronts your flesh and the spirit of God doesn't want you to have your way. He wants to have his way. For the spirit lusteth after the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. Now watch, and these are contrary the one to the other. So let me say it like this. I can't live for me and live for God. I can't live for me and live for God. I'm going to have to make up my mind and say, are you going to live for God or are you going to live for you? Because I will be in God's way and I will be contrary to what God wants. But yet God says, you surrender your life to me and let me lead you. I'll lead you and there will be no contrariness unless you get in the way. You, that is, your ideas and your desires get in the way of my, what we call perfect will. And God has a perfect will for everybody here tonight. Once again, all things were made by him and for him. God's got a perfect will with the lily. It's just the lily out here, they're growing out here in the front. It just automatically surrenders to God. And it opens up and exposes its beauty. God's got a perfect will for the rose. He's got a perfect will for all creation. All of creation, except for us, they just submit to God and they reveal their beauty. You can check this out in the wildlife area with animals, uh, in, the, in the fish life with the sea and, and how creatures express and how they possess a certain uh, criteria about them that expresses the creative power of God. And you are the same way, but yet you and I are at the highest. We are made after God's very image. We are the highest of of this particular thought here on earth. 
So for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led, verse 18, of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are these. So here's what he's telling me I got to look forward to if I do not want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and submit to him. Now the works, of, and these are, these are things that we've all been involved in. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revealings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he says, but, so that's one life. That's the life that we all lived before we came to know Christ. That's one life. But then he shows us this other life of the spirit. So this is the life of the flesh. This is the kind of fruits and the attitude and the life that's produced through the flesh that's not being led by God. But here is the life when this life of ours is surrendered to God. Here is the life that is reflected because of the spirit. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, Amen. peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ, that is Christians and born again believers, have crucified the flesh with the affections thereof. So a Christian, or Christians are not perfect, but is we have an old nature about us. And old, our old nature may say, how about this? And we gotta say no, and we gotta, we gotta kill that thing. We gotta say no, no, I'm not wanting to do that. Well, come on, we hung out and did this for years together. I said, no, no, I, I can't go down that road. So they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So our thought tonight is how to please God with your life. Now the Holy Spirit, who is mentioned here many times, the Holy Spirit is an individual. He's not an it or a something. He is a literal person that you just don't see. God is a triune God. There is God the Father, there is God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is just as real as I am talking to you tonight. Now when we're born, we're not born with the Holy Spirit. Because we've received sin, we have inherited sin, we are spiritually dead, Adam sinned and he messed up the gene pool and he's passed that messing up of the gene pool on to all of us and as the psalmist says we come forth speaking lies. In our mother's womb um, we were conceived in sin. So it's very natural for me and you to sin. It's very natural for us to live contrary to God. It's very natural. We don't need to be taught how to do wrong. We don't need to be taught how to lie and how to do them things. We know how to do these things. It's our sin nature. But to do right. Now that's a challenge right there. And that takes a, <laughs> that takes a greater living within us. That takes the Spirit of God living within us. And when we get saved, and when we give our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, He comes into our life in the person of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes in to help us live a new life. We heard it tonight. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. What old things? Well, we all got a little bit of a different background, but the one thing we all got in common about our background uh, wasn't good. Yours may not be to the extent of mine, and mine not be to the extent of yours, but one thing we can both agree on, the life that we used to live wasn't good. And if we stayed on that path and stayed living in that life, we'd have wound up dead, we'd have wound up in prison, sooner or later we'd have wound up in hell. I mean, that's, that's the reward of living a life that's not led by the Spirit. That's living a life that's led by the flesh and the flesh desires, which all the world, by the way, is caught up into tonight. Most of the world is caught up into this. 
But when we get saved, God places his Holy Spirit in us. So now we have a new birth. My first birth, my mom and dad gave me. My second birth comes from above, being born of the Spirit. Now I got a new birth. And I see things different. I don't want to do them things no more. And I don't want to live that way because the one living inside me tells me, because that's not right. Don't go that route. Don't do that. That's not right. And he will deal with us in accordance to Scripture. He'll never contrary Scripture. So the Holy Spirit is how we please God with our life. We don't please God by self-reformation and being a good little boy. We don't please God by doing deeds and doing this and doing that. We please God by allowing him to have his will and way in our lives. Now, once again, you are unique. I'm not you and you're not me, but you're unique in who you are and God's got a plan for your life. And it may not be what his plan is for my life, but the plans that God has for you and the plans that God has for me, they coincide and they work together for one purpose, to bring honor and glory to his name. So you're important to me, I'm important to you, we're all important to God. And this life that we're to live, we are to live by being as obvious as said, by the Spirit of God living in us. Now, the Holy Spirit, again, as soon as we call on Jesus Christ and we get saved, he comes into our life. It's a very real new birth. It's a second birth and it's very real. And the Holy Spirit resides in each believer's life to encourage a few things. Well, a lot of things, but peace. The Holy Spirit lives in us to encourage joy, liberty, hope, power, guidance, love, faith, godliness, and likewise virtues. There's a lot of different things that the Holy Spirit wants to encourage our lives in. Now, such encouragement from the Holy Ghost creates a behavior that is pleasing and God-honoring. And that's what we're talking about tonight, how to please God with your life. Everything in nature tonight pleases God, perhaps us. We're the only things that would probably say, well, we're not really pleasing him. But all the creation is right with him. Whether it's the little chiggers crawling in the grass, to the eagle that's soaring in the sky, to the elephant in the fields of Africa, it doesn't matter. The stars, hey, uh, we got out of church last week and I told Naomi, I said, look up there. And she said, look at what? I said, look at all them stars. She goes, yeah. I said, God has a name for every one of them and knows every one of them by name. Amen. The Christian life is a life that honors God by expressing godliness to a godless society. The Christian life, though, can be jeopardized. The Christian life. Not by the Holy Ghost who resides within us. The Christian life cannot be jeopardized by God, but rather by us not allowing the Holy Spirit's resident in us to be effectual. We would call this maybe grieving the Holy Spirit. Or um, we would call this quenching the Holy Spirit. And it simply means I'm not going to do what God tells me to do. And when we do that, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Have you ever been grieved? You know only a person can be grieved? You, we deal with the word quench. The Bible says quench not the Spirit. And the word quench deals with like putting out a fire or, or smothering something so it can't exist. So we have the ability as Christians to quench and to grieve the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, it's obvious that we would not be pleasing God with our lives. The only means of pleasing God is to honor his personal agenda with your life, which can only be carried out by our total surrender to the Holy Spirit. That's the only way we can reveal the plan of God through our lives. We got to surrender to God. We got to submit to him or we got to yield. You know, the Bible mentions in the book of Romans, to whom ye yield yourselves to, that's your master. We can yield our hands to a lot of things that are, that are bad, cruel, wicked, hard masters. We can yield our eyes to a lot of things that are cruel masters. But yet we can yield our hands and our body and our mind to the master, Christ Jesus. And he's a kind, loving shepherd, isn't he? Apart from the Holy Ghost, we cannot produce a life that assures others of the power of the pure gospel and its effect. 
Now, what did Paul say? Going back to chapter two, verse 20, which we're springing off of, he said this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust thereof. And that allows the life that we now live by faith to be manifested. And that is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8. You know, in that particular book, in that particular chapter, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 20 two times in that chapter 22 times and we find stuff like this for they that are after the flesh God I don't want to listen to God that's fine and you're going to be after the flesh but watch they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit so people who mind the flesh are interested in coming to church they're not interested in reading the Bible they're not interested in praying they're not interested in telling people about Christ because they're after the flesh. But people who are living after the Spirit, well, when the doors are open, we try to be here. We try to pray. We try to honor the Lord with who we are. We're living a different life because we're being led by a different nature. We're being led by a divine nature, once again, which happens when we get saved. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I can put my mind on things on the world and say, I don't need to listen to the Bible. But he tells me, Joe, if, if you want a carnal mind, I want to tell you what the end result is. It's death. But if you want to spiritually mind yourself and get your mind renewed by me, you're going to enjoy life and you're going to enjoy peace. That's just how this goes. And he goes on and says this, and here's why. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's at war against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither, did it, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now listen to verse 13 of Romans 8. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. For the wages of sin is death. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now listen to verse number 26. Likewise, the Spirit of Romans chapter 8 also helpeth our infirmities, that is our weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit, the Holy Spirit itself, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So what I'm, what I'm trying to show you, fact is, if the pure gospel with, with the church at Galatia was flirting with, which is a big no-no, if the pure gospel is replaced, cut, ignored, or becomes one of the long, the long list of religious do's and don'ts, the Christian can produce a life that is quite contrary to the pure gospel's power. Verse 17 uh, in our text, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, contrary. Now being religious is not the same as being righteous. There's a big difference in being religious and being righteous. The fruit and the works are different because they are different in nature. Flesh versus the spirit. What are the works of the flesh? We read them. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revealings, and likewise. That's the works of the flesh. That is contrary to, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Them are contrary, you see. Or them contrary. They're contrary. And you know that. Now, our goal as a people is to please God. Our goal is to please Him. 
which involves number one, walking in the spirit. Only you can do this for you. Walking in the spirit. Look at verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit. What does it mean when Paul the apostle says to the church at Galatia, to them people, you need to walk in the spirit. What's he telling us here? What does this mean to walk in the spirit? Well, this walking in the spirit means this, to move along with. You know, as that child starts to take its first few steps, typically mom or dad will hold its hand and hold it up and it'll, you know, kind of stumble a little bit. And then every now and then dad will let go and, you know, the child will fall over. He's getting back up. And there comes a time as he's walking that that little child starts to, you know, give it one of these. And they go, hey, you're doing it. And you go call the wife or call somebody. And they said he took his first, she took his first, her first step. And then there, you know, maybe a time where, you know, you grab their hand and you just walk with them. And sometimes I've been out in the woods and my boys, I say, now follow me. And there's snow on the ground and they're trying to step in my footsteps in the snow, following me. So the idea of walking in the spirit means this, move along with God. Move in course with God. There is a path. Fact of the matter is, in the gospel of Matthew chapter seven, there's one path, it's called the straight and narrow. There's another path in Matthew chapter seven, it's called wide and broad. One leads to life, one leads to destruction. We need to move along with God. So the idea of walking in the spirit, it has the idea of coming aside and walking with as a child would walk with its parent. Now, what is the big deal about walking in the spirit? Well, if you're walking in the spirit, you're gonna be aided in your life. You're gonna be helped in your life. You're gonna be encouraged in your life. In what way? You're gonna be aided from acting wrong. Now, if we look at our verse, in verse 16, he says this, I say then, walk in the spirit. Now look at the aid and the help. Walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if we will walk alongside God and we'll walk on the path of God and we'll, as a child, take God by the hand and we'll walk in the spirit, we are assured aid, we are assured guidance from acting wrong. Or let me say carnal. Or let me just say this, we can be aided from fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And that's what he says. Walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, I'll tell you another thing that this does for us. So walking in the spirit, number one, aids us from acting wrong. Number two, this is very important. Walking in the spirit helps you from being in a place of contrary. Boy, that's a place I don't like to be at. What does it mean to be in a place of contrary? It's kind of like this, knowing what you ought to do, but not being able to do it and struggling with that. Knowing that you can't go on like this, but you go on like that and you can't do nothing about it. It's contrary. And I think everybody has an intuitive about them. Verse 17, he says, for the flesh lusteth against the flesh and the spirit against the spirit. And these are contrary contrary. Someone says, hey man, what are you doing with your life? And you say, don't, don't go down on me. I know I, I'm trying to figure this thing out. And in your mind, you know, something's contrary. That's why Paul, the apostle said in the book of Romans, I know that is in me, that is in my flesh. Well, no good thing. You know, my flesh is totally contrary to God. And so is yours. It's totally contrary to God. Our flesh is just totally contrary. And I don't like being in a place of contrary. I don't like God getting in my heart and convicting me about things. And I, I mean, I don't, let me back up. I do appreciate the conviction of the Lord. But man, I, you know, getting convicted about doing something and you know, and because when you get convicted, you gotta make it right the best you can. And being in a place of contrary, if we'll walk in the spirit, we won't find ourselves in this place of being in the contrary. Now listen, there are two types of behavior, but the, the thing here is they will not be unified. We cannot walk in the flesh and walk with God at the same time. 
We're going to have to walk with one another. Now, it's possible to be saved and be carnal and walk in the flesh, but we're going to be contrary. And when we're contrary, guess what's going to happen? We're going to grieve the Holy Spirit. We're going to quench the Holy Spirit. And God's going to say, buddy, I'm not happy about this. In some way, shape, or form, he's going to come into your life and he's going to interfere with your life. He's going to interfere with your living. And I don't know how he does that. Sometimes he throws somebody through a windshield. Sometimes they get stabbed. Sometimes they get shot. I don't know how God, sometimes they get this, they get that. But I can tell you, God's got his ways of getting the attention of his creatures. Sure he does. And it can even be bad enough to where the Bible says, as we know it, we see examples in the Bible where there's a sin unto death and God says, that's it. That's it. I'm done with this. And we don't want to definitely cross that line. And I'm just saying we don't want to be in a place of contrary. You know what the word contrary means here? It means you're moving in the opposite direction. Friend, it's a sad day as Christians when we're supposed to be walking toward the straight and narrow and we make up our mind to turn around and walk the other way. That's not good at all. Contrary means you're in the opposite way. You're not obeying God. You're obeying yourself. You're not listening to God. You're listening to yourself. You're not following God. You're following the desires of your heart. And that's contrary. And God says, if you'll walk with me, you'll walk in the spirit, I'll minimize this contrariness in your life. And you know what the contrariness is. You know what the result is afterwards. What was I thinking? Why did I do that? I wish I'd never done that. You know, that's part of the human nature and it's part of something that we deal with. And walking in the spirit not only aids us from not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, it not only it helps us from not being in a place of contrary because I just want to say it again, your carnality and spiritual uh, principles and spiritual application are not going to be unified. It helps us to do what we should. Well, if you look at verse 17, he says, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other. Watch so that you cannot do the things that you would. Um, there are things that the Bible says I need to be doing. And the Spirit of God helps me do them things. Walking with the Spirit helps me do them. And, and the fact of the matter is, we all need to try to do right in accordance to God. We're talking about living a life that pleases God. All right, so walking in the Spirit is the first principle of how to please God. Secondly, Let's look at verse number 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit. Now here's another thought. Led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, when we deal with the word led of the Spirit, what does this word mean? Well, it kind of deals with uh, having a guide by your side. Kind of got the idea of going out and maybe Alaska. Let's, let's pick the, 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 the big wilderness in Alaska. And let's say you got it all worked out and you've hired a guide. He's got 50 years of being in Alaska. And you're in your little plane. And you fly in, you got your tent, you're gonna be there for a week. And you fly in and you land. And the guide says, all right, let's start getting your equipment out. And you get the tent out and you get some things out. Maybe you're hunting, maybe you're just hiking, maybe you're on a photography uh, type uh, expedition. And, uh, and you know, your back is turned and you hear, I'll see you later. And you look and the guide's leaving and say, whoa, 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 where are you going? Buddy, you're all on your own. Oh, no, 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 no. You might jump on that plane and hold on to that thing. Oh, you ain't hope to stop. And I'm just saying the guide is important in your life. Yeah, Having the right guide in your life is extremely important, friend. You know why? Because we're living in a wilderness. And it don't take much and it don't take long to get lost in this thing. We need a guide. We need someone who knows the way. Being led of the Spirit. This thought is being guided by showing the way. You know who knows the way? Not me, but God. God knows the way for every one of us here tonight. For next week, if it happens, next month, 10 years from now, God knows the way for you. He know, I don't know this way. That's why he says, let me help you. And I'll lead you in the right way, in the proper way, in the path that's righteous. Now, our flesh 
don't know the way. How do you know that? Because the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end is the way of death. That's general. That's just how that goes. Everybody in this room thought that one time in your life, you were on the right way and you had to learn some things. Everybody in this room, this is part of, this is part of natural human experience. But you've also known, that's why the shepherd David could say this in Psalms 23. That's why David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. And he talks about restoring his soul, his rod and staff uh, comforting him. But here's what I wanted you to hear. Verse one, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What's he saying? I got everything I need. As long as I follow him, I, don't, I got it all. I got everything. And I'm just saying, we please God by being led of the Spirit. Him guiding us and showing us the way. Our flesh don't know the way. The only thing our, fre- our flesh knows is bondage. We try this, well, that wasn't good. We get out of that. We try this, uh, that wasn't good. We get out of that. We try this, oh, that wasn't right. We get out of that. We try this, that wasn't good. We get out of that. That's the best we're going to get from us. And there's got to be more to it than that than there is. But the Spirit of God, so, so the flesh leads us in the way of bondage. And that would be the effort trying to please. I'm trying to do right, man. I'm trying to straighten things up. It seems like this. Every time I try to take two or three steps forward in my life, this happens and this happens and this happens. Well, friend, that's good and commendable that you're taking two or three steps in the direction. But that don't mean that direction is the right direction. Although it may seem it is. And the world's full of that. It's full of that. I mean, this is just reality. But when we follow the direction of being led by the Spirit of God, He knows the way. And He leads us in the path of freedom. And that is the freedom from bondage. Now, being under the law, what's He saying here? But if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. There's a real good note there. Here's what it means. Not under bondage of the effort to please God by law works. And then lastly, look at verse number 25. If we live in the Spirit. So we see in verse 16, Paul says, walk in the Spirit. In verse 18, he says, be led of the Spirit. And then in verse 25, he says, if we live in the Spirit. Now see that two little if word? That means that there's a possibility that you choose something different. There's a possibility here you can choose something different. And I want to say we please God by lastly living in the Spirit. Now what does it mean to live in the Spirit? It means having a life anew. Having a brand new life. That's what it means, living in the Spirit. It means a new life. Listen to what Paul said when he wrote to the church that was at Colossae. In chapter 3, let me quote to you a couple verses. Verse 1, he says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ setteth on the right hand of God. Set, watch this, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. So it's a new life from where? Above. And we're to set our affection on things that will wear above. Living in the spirit. What did Paul say? I have a new life. And the life that I now live, I live in the, uh, I live in the flesh, I live by faith. Or live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul, in Acts chapter 17 said this, and we'll conclude, about living in the Spirit. In verse number 28, Paul said about life, the life that he had received. Now, by the way, let me talk a little bit about the life of Paul. Did he have any authority to talk about this kind of subject? Well, was he always Paul the great Christian? No, no. The, he, he, his own testimony was this. I lived the life quite contrary to that of the Christian faith. Paul was a man who killed Christians.